putting them all together. Let me take a couple of more slides here and I'm going to show you how we actually do that. Well, the first step we take is we take Boyle's Law and Charles Law. So here's Boyle's Law, here's Charles Law, and we're only going to take a look at the left side of the equation. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to abandon the right side. It just means that we're just, for the purpose of demonstration, I'm just going to look at the left side. But you're going to be doing the same exact thing to the right side. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at this right side and we're going to multiply both of these sides. So we're going to take the P1, V1, and we're going to bring it down here. And then we're going to take the V1, T1 of Charles Law on the left hand side and we're going to bring it down and we're going to multiply these two together. Now, we're going to do the same exact thing to the right side of the equation. So we're going to take the P2, V2 and we're going to bring it over and we're going to take the V2 divided by T2 and bring it down. And when we do, that's going to give us the same number. Now I know I just wrote here V1 divided by T1, but that just goes to show that we have the same number because both of these things are equal to one another. Okay, And so that's essentially what we've got here. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the left hand side. And if we look at this side, we, if we multiply these two together, we're going to do the following. We're going to go ahead and use distributive property to find out what the products are going to be. And when we do this, we're going to get on the numerator P1 times V1 times V1 divided by T1. Okay. Notice that we multiply the numerator separately from the denominator. So we divide, divide across in the numerator and then divide across in the denominator. And that's how we get these two. When we go ahead and factor these a little bit further, multiply it all, we're going to get P1 times V1 squared divided by T1. Since the V1 is multiplied by itself, what we wind up getting here is a squared number over here. Now, we take this section that we've already done. Now we're going to introduce Guy-Lussac's law. And when we introduce Guy-Lussac's law, we're going to essentially multiply it as well. And again, we're going to use distributive property to do this. And so we're going to get P1 times V1 squared times P1 in the numerator. And then we're going to get T1 times T1 in the denominator. And so this is what we've got here. When we actually multiply it all the way out, we wind up getting P1 squared times V1 squared divided by T1 squared. Notice the one thing that they all have in common are squares. Each of these are squares. And so we want to go ahead and simplify. Same thing that you do in mathematics, we're going to go and do that here. We're going to simplify this uh, product that we've got here. And so the way we do that is we're going to go ahead and take the square root. So if we take the square root of this number, what that is going to do is that's going to give us a situation where we're going to be canceling not only the square root, but we're also going to be canceling the powers or the squares. And so those go ahead and cancel as well, leaving us nothing but P1 times V1 divided by T1. Now, this is only half of the full equation. Remember that. We still need to do the same thing to the other side. And when we do, we get the following. Okay? So notice the left-hand side is P1 times V1 divided by T1. And this is going to be equal to P2 times V2 divided by T2. And so this is what we call the combined gas law, at least the one we consider to be final in class. Okay, and so here's the equation. It's, it's, it's important that you go ahead and write this down. It's very important. So now the one thing we look at this, though, although this is something that's often talked about in classes across many uh, chemistry classrooms, one of the things that they really don't talk about is they never incorporate Avogadro into this equation. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to ignore it. We are actually going to include Avogadro's because we still need to do this in order to, to get the full version of the uh, combined gas law. Now, technically, this is the combined gas law, but it lacks Avogadro. So Avogadro's law stated at the very beginning that volume is proportional to, to the number of moles. And so because of that, we have to include moles, which we're going to represent as a letter N, into the equation that we just derived. Okay, So we're going to take this combined gas law, and then we're going to incorporate Avogadro. And if we do, we're going to incorporate Avogadro in the following positions, in the denominator on both sides. Now, this is what the combined gas law should look like, okay, when we have pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles. Now, for the sake of doing this, we really need to come back a little bit just for a second and talk about what, what we talked about when we started this chapter, which was that gases normally do not, are not ideal. They don't really behave in any certain way, uh, except how gases behave, but sometimes they do have these uh, ways of behaving that comes very close to behaving in an ideal fashion. But when we talked about this ideal, we need to really talk about what the conditions are. And so these ideal conditions that allows a gas to behave in, in an ideal way are the following. 
And that means that when we talk about the pressure, what we're really referring to is we're talking about one atmosphere of pressure. When we talk about temperature, we're really referring to 273 Kelvin, which is the absolute or rather the standard temperature. And when we're talking about volume under these ideal conditions, we're talking about 22.4 liters. And the number of moles involved are going to be one moles. And so if I can go in here and let's look at the on the right hand side of the equation, since P is equal to one atmosphere, T is equal to 273 Kelvin, volume is equal to 22.4 liters, and N is equal to one mole. What if I were to come in here and replace P2, V2, T2, and N2 with these values? And in fact, that's what we're going to do. So let's go ahead and replace these values into this area, and we've got them here. And once we do this, we see that we've got now, now have a numerator and a denominator. And so let me simplify this and remove this and clean it up a, a bit for us. So let's put this here. And notice, once we substitute, substitute the values, we get the following equation on the top. And so we're going to go ahead and multiply across and multiply these two numbers. So if I take one atmosphere multiplied by 22.4 liters, what I get in the numerator in the second equation is 24.4 atmosphere liters. And if I take the denominator of the first equation on the top here, 273 times one mole, what we're going to wind up getting is 273 Kelvin mole. Simplifying this a little bit further, if I take these two numbers now, 22.4 atmosphere liters, divide that by 273 Kelvin mole, what we wind up getting is this number here, 0 0.0821. Notice the units. The units of this particular number that we've derived is atmosphere liters per Kelvin mole. Now, this 0 0.0821 has a special name. It's actually a constant. And this constant is what we call uh, R. And this R is what we call the ideal gas constant. And it can be used to solve a lot of problems using the ideal gas law. In fact, we're almost there. This is actually, for all intents and purposes, is the ideal gas law. But you probably have seen the ideal gas law written slightly different. And so let me show you what that looks like here. We're going to take the R, we're going to replace 0 0.0821 with this R. And so I'm going to go ahead and put it in here in this equation, and here it is. So I'm going to take this R, replace it right here in the middle, and this now begins to look like the ideal gas law that you are probably familiar with, especially if you read the chapter. And so let's go ahead and clean it up a little bit without the numbers. And this here is the ideal gas law. So you can see that we can take Boyles, Charles, Guy Lussac, Avogadro, and we can come up with not only a combined gas law, but we can also come up with the ideal gas law. And this ideal gas law will help us identify any problem that we have using gases. Assuming we've got very close to ideal conditions, we can use this law and make it work for us. Okay. So we just learned about the equations. Now in the next video, what you want to do is you want to go ahead and put this knowledge to the test and see if you can identify the actual equation for the test for the various sample problems that I've already prepared for you. So take a look at that video and we'll talk to you soon.